trust. I uh, would also want to thank the panelists for making it down to Mashingo in such a short notice and would also want to thank them uh, for being part of this important process because we thought it was very, very fundamental and prudent for them to participate in this key process of trying to unpack, trying to look at uh, the constitutional amendment number two. Uh, this is a, a constitutional amendment number two after the amendment, amendment number one, which was done in 2016. And uh, we thought it is fundamental and important for us as Mashingoids to then look into this discussion to try and look at how we as a people, how we as citizens can contribute to this national discourse. We also want to thank uh, Lucy for making some time and effort to come down to Mashingo. We also want to thank um, uh, all media practitioners, all development practitioners, students from the law school and all meet the, the journalists who are here, who are part of this important process. Why we have created this platform is because we want citizens, we want to develop, we want to have an info, informed citizenry in Zimbabwe that can be able to contribute positively and meaningfully to the national discourse. So these constitutional amendments that have been proposed are a key, are a key step in making sure that Zimbabwe becomes a so it is important also as we are going through this process for us to then look at the, the broader the broader vision of what is it that we really want to be as Zimbabweans and also to then also we are also going to hear more on those people who presided who were the co chief co chairpersons of the COPAC process that gave birth to the constitution that we are talking about today. I would also want to thank the Kotra and Tell Zimbabwe team who worked tirelessly to we ensure, under short notice to try and create this platform so that citizens in Mashingo can then interface with, with uh, these panelists who are here today. Uh, it is also important today to make sure that it, there are several activities that are going to follow. Today, I think the Parliament of Zimbabwe has even set dates for public hearings uh, on this proposed bill, which the dates are from the 30th of March to the uh, 2nd of April. And for Mashingo Province, we are going to have uh, public hearing sessions in Mucheke Ho, we are going to have uh, sessions in Chiwi, we are going to have sessions in Saka. So I think this is an ongoing discussion that we need to keep engaged in citizens of Zimbabwe. So I really expect this to be a process that we are going to be engaging, a process that we are going to then follow closely and also contribute uh, meaningfully and positively. Can you please enjoy the, this night at this moment? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gamu, for your welcome remarks. I will not take much of your time uh, at this moment. Uh, you help me to welcome uh, uh, Lucy uh, Chwasa to give us uh, maybe a breakdown of what we mean by uh, the constitu proposed constitutional amendments, uh, major highlights, and probably have you as a lawyer before we go to uh, Honorable Mambana and Honorable Mwanzora to really talk into the issues uh, that were raised and maybe what has changed now. So at the moment, help me to welcome Lucy as she stands up. Thank you very much, uh, Golden. Uh, like Golden said, um, I'm a legal practitioner uh, with a special interest in constitutional law, and as such I'm a holder of a Master in Constitutional Law and Human Rights, and I also pursued constitutional law in other jurisdictions. So my perspective really is on what I perceive the amendment to be, and juxtapositioning it with other jurisdictions as well. I will not go much into the analysis because I, I respect that we have the two uh, co-chair persons, the people who hands on uh, in writing the constitution and uh, the people who have maybe reasons for some of the provisions that I also wonder as a legal practitioner how we ended up with such provisions. So in as much as I'm a panelist, 
I'm also looking forward to have some of my questions answered by the two honorable members. So my, my presentation is in such a way that I give a brief background on the amendment uh, of the constitution like Gamu and um, um, Golden said, we have a constitution that we started using in 2018 that came into existence after the government of national unity. I know everyone knows that uh, brief history. So in um, 2016, 2017, we had the amendment number one that uh, was in relation to the powers of the president in terms of appointing the chief justice and the deputy chief justice and also the judge president of the high court. And that's the constitutional amendment number one. Today we are talking about the second amendment. Uh, we refer to it as the um, amendment bill number two. It was gazetted last year and later on gazetted again early this year. The constitutional amendment number two that we are discussing tonight uh, seeks to introduce at least 27 um, amendments to the current constitution. That is to say the amendment bill number two is touching on things that are almost 27 that we seek to change in the, in the current constitution that we are using. So I looked at uh, some of the, con uh, of the areas that are going to be amended. If there is anything that I would have omitted, I'm hoping that um, Honorable Mangwana and Honorable Munzora may be able to also pick on them. So firstly, I, the, the amendment seeks to speak to uh, the presidential powers to appoint and remove the vice presidents. Um, and the other one is um, the amendment that seeks to give the president more powers in terms of appointment and the extension of the tenure of the judges of the superior courts. Uh, the third one that I looked at is um, the extension of the women's quota system in the current constitution. So we had a quota system for the five for a five-year voting period, like two terms for, uh, from the time we had the new constitution to 2018, we are supposed to be using the quota system for women, the uh, parliamentarians, but the amendment seeks to extend that. It does not only seek to extend the women's quota system, but it also seeks to add the quota system and extend it to the young people, that is to the youth. Um, the, the, the amendments, so I'm saying it will limit, it will end, because this is my view and is open to criticism and discussion like Golden Saint. So the other thing that I looked at is uh, the limiting, the, the limit that the, the current amendments will also seek to limit the powers of the Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission by placing some of its functions in the hands of the public pro uh, protector, who is also, according to these amendments, appointed solely by the president. And it will also limit parliament powers um, in the adoption um, of international treaties, among other far-reaching issues. Um, it also, uh, the amendment will also seek to extend the presidential powers in the appointment and removal of the prosecutor general, and extending the executive representation uh, by unelected officials in the cabinet among other issues like uh, the issue of appointing specialists in the cabinet who are not coming from any political parties or who are not any politicians, like we're taking specialist people or people who have expertise in certain areas to form part of the cabinet. Um, the constitution itself, uh, allow me to say that the constitution itself as it is in its current form, it allows, it provides for the amendment. So from a legal point of view, I don't think the amendments are illegal because the constitution allows uh, the, 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 the parliamentarians with the majority to amend the constitution, but not the whole of it. There are certain sub sections that cannot be amended without going to a referendum. And the ones that they seek to amend allows uh, the party with two-thirds majority to, to amend. But like uh, Gamu said, that they're going to do hearings, they're going to consult you, they also want to hear what you think about the amendment. So you also need to read and formulate your own opinion in the way that I formulated mine. So um, what I 
think or what I perceive as the implications according to the theme of this discussion is that um, I personally think that uh, amending the constitution in this way uh, kind of is retrogressive, like it's taking us back to where we are coming from. I, I was, uh, to those of you who are close to me or those of you who follow me on social media, you would know that during the corporate time, I was not team take part, I was team take charge and I'm proud about that. There are things that I didn't want about the corporate constitution, but there are things that I wanted about the corporate constitution. But for progress sake, we all said, oh well, we have a constitution, can we at least work with what we have? So. My major issue with amending these sections is there are sections that we are seeking to amend that we have not tested. For example, the issue of the quota system, the provisions with relation to devolution. Why are we amending these prior to 2023 instead of just implementing them and align them to the constitution and see whether or not it works? So in my view, I think we should not be amending a constitution, especially sections that we have not tested. And talking from a woman's point of view, I also love women's rights. I, I breathe and eat women's rights. I don't think it's fair to amend and say we are extending the quota system. And the general feeling that I have, being a young person, being a youth and also a woman, I feel like this provision is going to be used to have us fight each other. Like, I'm a young person, I would go to the women and say, hey, guys, I'm not going to because But can we not just implement the provision on equality instead of amending the constitution and saying, let's extend? Um, my other issue with uh, amending the constitution in this way, which is, by the way, legal is that a majority of Zimbabweans, I was the very minority of it, the majority of Zimbabweans voted for this constitution in a referendum. And they said this is what they want. I think it's very unfair to then go back and say we are amending what you said you wanted barely five, ten years ago, we are amending it. I have not seen any reason anywhere, and I'm hoping to get the reasons from this discussion why we are even amending this constitution. I know that there's an argument that says um, there's a political party that has two thirds majority and they are allowed to, to, to change the constitution because they are voting on behalf of their people. But what happens to those that directly voted during the COPAC time? What happens to the resources that we used to come up with this constitution? And also, uh, I think in conclusion, to go through all the issues that I have. But um, in conclusion, I also think it shows a lot of ingenuity and not being sincere when people seek to amend provisions that they have not implemented and say, oh, this is not working. Can we at least change it? For me, it's just like a matter of power to say I can, so I will, and you won't do anything. But I don't think that's progressive. Uh, what I think should be the way forward um, before I hand over to Golden, and I know we'll get into discussions, but personally what I feel we should do as a way forward, I urge parliamentarians from both political parties to think through these amendments, not from a political point of view, but to think of these amendments from the democracy point of view to think what it means to everyone, because there are certain provisions that I, when I go through them, I'm like, I don't want to say this, but the next president who use this constitution may just be more powerful than President Robert Mugabe, and I don't want that. I don't want another dictator. I don't want another one center of power. I don't want um, a president who's all powerful and almighty, even within his own party. So I'm saying, even if you're coming from the opposition, even if you're coming from the NCA, even if you're coming from an independent candidate, 
progressive people should know that there is need to have checks and balances. There's need to have separation of powers. There's no way we can concentrate once we can concentrate power in one person and be progressive. So I urge all parliamentarians, uh, the ones who are in here, the ones who see this presentation in the, um, on social media or by whatever means, to be progressive and not go through with the amendments. I think the government of Zimbabwe as a whole should reconsider withdrawing this bill because the consequences will be far reaching than the ones that we have from 1980 to the time then we then managed to remove the past president of this nation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lucy, for uh, the speech. Um, um, at this moment, uh, let me welcome Honorable Monzora. Help me to welcome him um, to this discussion. Um, thank you, Honorable, for coming. Um, just before you came, we were saying this is a discussion. This is not a debate. We respect and honor the commitment that you, uh, you three have made all the way from Harare, all of you, to come to join us to talk about key issues that directly affect our lives, key issues of our constitution. Uh, patriots talk about uh, key issues that affect them and probably map the way forward together. So this is a very important meeting to us, and we are honored to have, especially uh, the two of you who were at the forefront during the uh, coming up of the uh, 2013 constitution, the one that we have used uh, for the past uh, six or seven years. And now we have uh, proposed amendments and at least the two of you are in the room to discuss about this and uh, hopefully you will receive some questions from uh, uh, our participants. I shall not waste time. I will invite uh, Honorable Bopo Mangwana to probably explain in detail, uh, also minding time, what is exactly that the government is proposing to do probably starting from amendment number one to this amendment number two that we are talking about. Then Honorable Monzora will come and we have a discussion. Let's clap hands for him. Thank you very much. I, I am tempted to, to be in court <laughs> where a witness is being asked to answer the question. Allow me not to answer the question. The reason being that um, it is necessary to provide a proper foundation for this discussion. So the first question I want to answer, which you have not asked me, is it proper or is it correct to amend the Constitution? And I'll answer that question. When we wrote the Constitution, we were very clear that at some stage of his life it would require to be amended. We therefore provided for a mechanism for amending the constitution. Where we, we had provisions which could not be amended over a certain period of time, we said so. There are provisions in that constitution which cannot be amended before the expire of seven years. There are provisions in that constitution which cannot be amended before the expire of 10 years. There are provisions in that constitution which cannot be amended without a referendum. So my thesis is simple. We were clearly aware that parliament did power and we gave it power to amend the constitution. Where we did not want to provide for a time limit before the amendment, we did not provide a time limit. Where we thought the certain provisions so important that they could not be amended before the expire of a given time, we said so in that constitution. So in other words, 
whatever we said could not be amended before the expiry of a given period or without a referendum could be amended at any time. The next issue I will raise is that when we voted for the constitution, we answered only one question. Do you want the constitution? Yes or no? Without asking you whether that you wanted that provision or did not want that provision, we simply ask you one question. As it is. So whether you loved that constitution 60%, you simply had to answer yes or no. Even if you wanted it 90%, you answered yes or no. You were answering only one question. And you answered that question. That with these imperfections, I am voting for it. We in ZANU PF did not agree with everything which was in the Constitution. But for the sake of progress of the nation, we were in an inclusive government. And me and Douglas had agreed that we shall be the only part of the inclusive government which shall not fail. And we became the only part of the inclusive government which succeeded. Because we produced a document. And Douglas, is, if he wants to be honest with you people, knows that there were aspects which we only agreed a few days before the expiry of the inclusive government. There, was, there were deadlocks and deadlocks. So the constitution was a compromise. That document was a compromised document. It is not an MDC document. It's not a ZANPF document. It's not the other part. I, I'm sure it has now joined the other MDC, so it's one now. So it, <laughs> it were three parties at that time. So the document, and le, this is the honest truth the nation must know, that it was a compromised document. We also put in the constitution that in order for you to be able to amend that, the least amendment you can carry out in the constitution, you require a two-thirds majority in parliament. So if any political party did not want that constitution to be amended, it should have stopped Zanpia from acquiring a two-thirds majority. And it is naivety, if not insanity, for you to fail to use the power which you have been given by the people. By securing a two-thirds majority, we secured power to deal with all those provisions of the Constitution which we are not happy with. And the contestation around power should have been to stop Zanpia from acquiring a two-thirds majority, let us campaign strongly. And unfortunately, we won a two-thirds majority in parliament, and it is parliament which has got the power to change the constitution. A constitution is a living document. A constitution is a document which reflects the aspirations of the majority of the people who are ruling. It is a document which is used by the ruling class to rule a nation. And San PF has the two-thirds majority, it got the mandate from the people. It is now looking at those provisions. It reluctantly accepted for the sake of progress to be part of our constitution and it now has the authority to look at them, reflect on them, and if it feels that these require change, then change must be made to that constitution. ZANPF is a movement of democratic change. looking at that document and saying in the exercise of democratic powers can we change the document to reflect the thinking of the majority at this point in time of our history and it is doing exactly what MDC stands for so I am expecting Douglas Monzora to agree with me <laughs> that time has come 
to change that constitution so that it reflects the aspirations of the majority. At every given moment in time, the aspirations of a people change. And this is real. The aspirations of a people change. This is the reason why we in ZANPF are looking at this constitution and say, to what extent is it is still reflecting the thinking of the majority? The thinking of the people at the time the constitution came into being does not remain static. It cannot. Yes, we wanted to continue with certain powers of parliament. You can tell if you think that you, parliament should not exercise this particular power or that particular power. So the, the, the thesis I'm putting across to you is that if the people of Zimbabwe are in agreement with the thinking of ZANU-PF, they give ZANU-PF a two-thirds majority. When they've given it a two-thirds majority, they are also empowering it to create all laws of good governance, including changing the constitution, because it is the power to do so in the interests of the majority of the people it is now representing in parliament. That is the theory I put across. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mangwana. Let's clap hands for him. Um, thank you for interesting views. I personally am not a lawyer, but uh, seated with uh, three lawyers here up front. I think uh, it's a very difficult moment. I shall not comment much, um, save to say that um, uh, to remind uh, everyone that we are live streaming uh, this event uh, so that um, even after today, we can revisit the discussion. You can share the link with your friends, colleagues who are out, uh, who are not in this room, so that they can also benefit. I've been following uh, online. Many people, even those that are not in Zimbabwe, are following, and they are happy with the discussions. And I want to thank you for uh, listening attentively without interjections. At this moment, I will hand over the mic to Honorable Monzora. Gordon. Um, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank the organizers of this uh, uh, discussion for inviting us. Uh, I want to assure you that uh, we in the real movement for democratic change do not take uh, this uh, for granted. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a serious issue on our hands today. There are some realities that existed before the making of this constitution. And these realities include immediately, immediately after independence, we noticed black on black oppression. We noticed the discrimination among black communities. In other words, we noticed the uh, a form of black apartheid. There was political violence, starting with Gukura Hundi, Muramba China, the 2008 election, uh, election runoff, um, and the murder, maiming of innocent civilians uh, through state-sponsored violence. These were the realities existing in Zimbabwe. There was uh, violence accompanying the uh, land reform program, uh, there were extrajudicial killings. We in the MDC in 2008 alone uh, lost 300 youngsters, including Tondera Indira, Beta Chokururama, Godfrey Kauzani, Shepard Jani, and many, many others. We had in our country one center of power. President Mugabe did everything, appointed the judges, appointed the prosecutor, de decided the life of parliament, even appointed members of parliament. That was the reality that we had. Um, we had a conflation of the state, the party, and the military. The person you found in the, in the Politburo was the person you found in the cabinet, 
was the person you found in parliament, was the person you found in the army. So there was conflation of the party, the military, and the executive. And I've already talked about the 2008 violence. Now, we decided to go for a constitution-making process. And this constitution-making process was in terms of an agreement, the global political agreement. And the constitution-making process was democratic, it was inclusive, and it was people-driven. So the, the product that came is a democratic product, an inclusive product, and a people-driven product. If you dare amend it using only one party, it is now a, a one-party document. Honorable Mangwana is correct that this document was a compromise document, taking into account the interests of all the communities. The effect of amendment of the Constitution on the basis that we willed two-thirds majority is converting it into a ZANU-PF partisan document, and that is not right. Now, my learned friend, uh, I just want to answer him before I go to the actual amendments. My learned friend says, because they were voted in, the ZANU-PF, and by uh, what they say, by the majority, they have the right to amend the constitution. But here is a stark reality. The people who voted for ZANU-PF in 2018 did not vote for ZANU-PF to change the constitution. They voted for ZANU-PF to change their lives, to bring jobs, to make sure that there was medicine in the clinics, to make sure that our people <laughs> do not continue wallowing in poverty and misery. It was to make sure that the youths had a future in this country. That was the mandate. It was not to mutilate the constitution as they are now doing. My friend, Honorable Mangwana, is correct. A constitution is a living document. But again, here is a reality about living documents or living creatures. They are capable of dying. They are capable of being killed. What ZANU-PF is doing is killing the constitution, the living document, and they are making it a dead document. Well, popularity in a single election does not convert automatically into rationality. You don't suddenly become wise because you've been elected a member of parliament. We have members of parliament whose logic, whose abilities sometimes do not, is worse than, uh, um, if, in, in, if you were in Kenya, I would say Wanjiku. Wanjiku in the Kenyan folklore is the lowest, lowest of, lo of the lowest women. Uh, who are in the rural areas, they are not educated, and so on. But they reason better than some of the people you see in Parliament. <laughs> what is this constitution doing? The constitution deals with, it removes the, the running mate. Ladies and gentlemen, Honorable Mangwana and myself, we are seated in one room uh, to look at this question. And we looked at the succession problems within ZANU-PF. We looked at how the presidents were choosing their deputies. And we noticed that the presidents usually choose deputies who are not a threat to them. They, choose, they would choose people who are more useless than them. So the running mate clause, we wanted to deal with smooth succession. It has to be automatic if a president dies or leaves office. We have to know who is going to take over. But number two, because we said to the president, presidential candidate, tell us who your deputy is, a deputy president became an election issue, thus guaranteeing the quality of the deputy president. The second thing that we did, now what ZANU-PF wants to do is to remove that so that the president chooses the, the vice president after the election. And there keeps his colleagues and comrades guessing. And when it comes to succession, they are returning us to the lottery clause. And the lottery clause is that the, 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 the last vice president who last acted becomes the acting president. Now, that is manipulable, isn't it? Then appointment of judges. We noticed 
that judges who were being appointed were people, some of them were people who did not know their jobs. They were boys, they were friends, they were comrades. But we also notice that these judges, especially the judges of the Supreme Court and the High Court, decide lives, matters of life and death. They, they, judge, they, they pass death penalties. We also dis, uh, uh, notice that they decide the presidential petitions. So they decide if it is challenged who runs the country. So we wanted to, to, to make sure that the Zimbabweans are satisfied of the quality of the people who will hold these matters in their hands. And we then said, judges must be appointed following public interviews. What President Munangagwa has now done is to take that power away. So judges of the Constitutional Court and the, and, and the Supreme Court and the High Court are not going to be subject to public interviews. What do we lose by subjecting people to public interviews? It, it gives the judges the time to answer questions about themselves and to parade their knowledge. So far, our judges have been appointed using uh, public interviews. We have not lost anything. Justice Malaba went through a public interview. Why should we now insulate other judges from going through the public interviews? Who do we want to appoint? So this is bringing back opaqueness in the judicial system, and we are against that. A prosecutor general, yes, they are, we, we had said, again, a prosecutor general appointment must not be simply by the president. There must be checks and balances. Now, according to this amendment, he is going to be appointed, he or she is going to be appointed by the president alone. Uh, delimitation. We said... We need to make sure that there is no cheating about the electoral boundaries. So there had to be factors to be considered. And we said one of the most important factors is population density. A member of parliament must represent a certain minimum of people. Now, what? so delimitation must follow a population census so that when they are doing their carving of the boundaries, they consider the, the correct population density. What ZANU-PF is doing in its wisdom or lack of it? What ZANU-PF is doing is that it is removing that. So uh, the, the, the delimitation of the constituencies does not have to follow population density. So this paves way for gerrymandering and they are preparing to rig, I'm sorry to say. Devolution, Honorable Mangwana and myself were agreed on this one. Devolution was an answer to uneven development. It was an answer to, um, uh, what do we call, the, it was an answer to, we wanted Zimbabweans to have a say in the, in the, in the development priorities of their, of, of their, of their, of their areas. Now what ZANU-PF is doing is that it is removing the uh, members of parliament from the provincial council, which decides the development priorities of that province. Why would you leave uh, MPs? I do not know. Now, in conclusion, uh, ladies and gentlemen, constitutions are built out of the distrust of politicians. You make a, polit a, a constitution because politicians are not trustworthy, so you bind them. And it has been said, constitutions are chains that we make for ourselves in our moments of sobriety to bind us in our moments of madness. So we make these chains before we get mad, we, before we get drunk, made with the power, drunk with the power. So it is a, a fundamental mistake that ZANU-PF is doing, changing the constitution because it is in power. So what does this constitution do? It retains executive and monarchical powers in the hands of the president. He is going to have more powers than Robert Mugabe. Uh, and I don't think that is a, a wise thing. And what this constitution is doing is that it is now formalizing the chief secretary to the president and cabinet. And many people don't see anything wrong with this. They don't see anything fishy with this. But let me tell you, 
that what this constitution is doing is converting the chief pres the chief secretary to the president and cabinet to a prime minister so he by all uh, 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 means and form is a prime minister and if my information is correct the president and the secretary to the president and cabinet are related so you have a president a brother the prime minister a brother again and we have now fossilized this into the constitution we wrote this constitution together honorable mangwana we must and when we wrote it we wrote it for the weak we wrote it for the people who are going to be in parliament we also wrote it for the people who are not going to be in parliament we wrote it for the majority we also wrote it for the minority a constitution is not worth the paper it is written on if it does not pro protect the minority now what my learned friend is saying is that because we are the majority we can do as we please that's not the spirit of the constitution after all zanu pf was not voted by the majority of zimbabweans zimbabwe has 13 million people zanu pf got about 2.2 point, 2 point no not not 2.6 that's too high it got 2 million 300 or something like that those are the people who thought that zanu pf should should run their affairs the majority didn't vote for zanu pf the 11 million people in this country did not vote for your party now your party can not say because we are in parliament we represent the majority no you represent 2 million out of 13 million it is my respectful submission that the changes of this constitution ladies and gentlemen are not called for this government has more problems to deal with than to change the constitution these youngsters i see here i'll be surprised if more than five are employed and i'll be surprised after next year if more than two will be employed that is what we must look at honorable mangwana that is the conundrum of the zimbabwean people that is the pedagogy of the zimbabwean people and therefore that is what we need to look at this constitution saves us right this constitution contains the most comprehensive bill of rights on the african continent and as the americans say if it ain't broken don't fix it thank you uh, thank you very much uh, honorable monzora i was still googling to find out what condandrum and <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll find it uh, uh, later. Um, thank you very much for these uh, interesting views from all the three speakers. Now, at this moment, I think um, we invite questions. Do we have a, a roving mic, Mr. Maposa? Ah, okay. So, I, but I, I think you can speak loud enough to be heard. We have limited time because I want also Fambane public transport, so we shall be brief. Into your questions. If you have a question, just be brief. One question, and we, we do that. And you say who is directed uh, by your question. Um, it's now open. There's a hint uh, before the camera person. Swanda. Uh, another question. Uh, yes, uh, my father is a lawyer. Yeah, firstly, uh, thank you, Mr. Mbaji. I want to put on the record that I do not belong to either of the 
part is better to use this uh, discussion. I will take this <laughs> basic discussion for the process. My, 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 my question is uh, directed to Comrade uh, Honorable Mamwana. Uh, I had a lot of questions, but since you said... Just aside. one. Oh, 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 okay. Now, my question is, if, if you go through this uh, document, this transition, we, we are now seeing that this section is a child of Zambia. This section is a child of MDC. We do not want a document that belongs to Zambia. We do not want a document that belongs to MDC. For example, uh, Comrade Bongwana, section 251, which talks of the uh, National Peace and Reconciliation, what, what, that commission was given a, a, a 10 year period to operate just because it's, 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 it's talking of peace. But we have the media commission, which, which, is a, which doesn't have a, a lifespan. So we, we then see that this section is a child of Zambia. But if I'm from my Jews, but where, where is my section? The constitution. <laughs> <laughs> so who are saying? These amendments, I heard the government of Wallace saying that uh, as Zambia have not uh, agreed to some provisions of, of the constitution, and it was very clever enough uh, not to mention the, 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 the actual provisions. Probably it might be sixty percent of the provisions. So now, because they have the, 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 the majority in, in the parliament, so now, now they want to correct all those provisions that they are not agreeing to. Which, 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 which is wrong when you voted for the constitution sometime in 2013. We never thought that we would be seated here discussing about the amendment the same constitution. So, my, the, the, the question is, are we not uh, converting this constitution into a one political party constitution? We might end up uh, incorporating the Zambia constitution into the national constitution. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Martha, for your question. Um, so far, two questions directed to uh, Honorable Mangwana. Uh, Say. My question is directed to both Mr. Mangwana, Honorable Mangwana, and Honorable Mangwana. You have said the majority in the parliament have a mandate to change the constitution. Does it mean whichever party will have? Thank you. So it's directed to both. If the MDC wins in 2023 with the two thirds majority, are we going to discuss again as we change the constitution? <laughs> uh, that's the question. Um, Honorable Stando. Vam Gabe Vari Vari Po Vakatora eighteen amendments. Imi Pasina five years Zaripo Maita twenty seven amendments. It all funds and not Saka Kanam Kao twenty Kawaz five years. Kana Chichika. Can I Gamba? Are you not uh, saying Kuanavis Bab? Constitution E, Muchai Cheka Cheka, Kitazi Gamba, Panasarapas Natural. This is the Papa Dukh, the Oku Piko, Kwachi, you come a Kambo one, Munu, no Tanga Kuti, Asat Aja, Uro Tanga Kuiza, a salt. Muro Tanga Kuku Amenda, Zunza, I'm sad, Maka, Sasaka, just the same. Okay. Um, my friend there. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, I have um, questions directed to. Let's make it one. The, the priority among the okay. questions that they have. Okay, I wanted to ask both of them. It's okay. Um, to Honorable Mangwana, like um, what uh, Honorable Mondora said. <laughs> Why fix it? Uh, I would like you to maybe highlight to us what problems 
are we facing actually right now with the running mate clause? That's one. Two, with the PG selection, the prosecutor general selection, and the judge's selection. What problems are we facing? Because currently, I, I've not noticed anything, everything is working well. We do need people to be interviewed publicly. So we see, we are the people of Zimbabwe. We need to see who is getting elected in these offices. And then for Mr. Mwonzora, are you saying that there's absolutely nothing that needs amending in the Constitution? Thank you very much for the two questions. <laughs> they, were, they were worth it. Um, maybe... Majority. Why do we amend the I think, I, I think let me start with the question. The constitution was voted by the majority. So why amend it? My answer is simple. The constitution is a living document. And we were very clear even at the time we brought the constitution to the people that at some stage of its life, it would require to be amended. Where we felt that certain amendments should not be done before the expiry of certain times, we said so in the Constitution. And those provisions which should not be amended before the expiry of the time given in the Constitution are not being amended. So in other words, any other provision where a time period was not fixed in the Constitution can be amended at any time as long as two-thirds of the parliamentarians vote to, to amend. So the amendments are clearly within the law. The amendments are being done in terms of the very same Constitution which we are using to run this country. Yes, 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 yes. The provision relating to the running mate, um, it's a succession clause, right? And the, to provide stability, political stability in a country, you want the party which is running the country and its leadership. The president must pick a cabinet of his choice. Right? So he's the one who must select his own vice presidents. In the event that there is a vacancy in the office of that president, the party which has been given the mandate to rule should have the opportunity of selecting the successor to finish the term so that they can complete the, the programs they have sold to the people. Uh, let me say, when, when people vote for a president, they are also voting for the party which he is uh, actually ruling the country with. We know we've got a, a presidential election and a parliamentary election. But we are both a presidential democracy and a parliamentary democracy, but at the end of the day, it is the party which is being led by that president which will be running the country. So in the event of a vacancy arising in the office of the president, that party which has sold its manifesto to the people should be able to provide a successor um, uh, to the office of the president. And there's nothing wrong with, with that kind of a provision. Why are you not going back to the people to hear what they say rather than changing the parliament? Oh, yeah. We, we, we are still going to the people. I think uh, people will be carrying out um, uh, consultations with the people before. Uh, th that's why you are given... Um, uh, 90 days to consider the, the, the bill even before it's debated and then now parliamentarians will be moving around constituencies hearing your views. If you have got views which are different from uh, uh, the provisions, you have an opportunity of saying so. When parliament calls 
for, for, for public hearings, please go and attend so that they will take into account uh, the views you express when they, when they visit you. Uh, but at the end of the day, if the bill is to be voted in Parliament, we, in our wisdom, at the time we wrote the Constitution, we said as long as it has two-thirds majority support in Parliament, those provisions which are being amended can be amended. But your views will be taken into account. Um, no, I, I think let me correct something. The amendment is not saying that judges shall not be interviewed. Let me correct that. Every judge who occupies the post of judge in Zimbabwe shall be subjected to public interviews. They will be subjected. It's only when you have now interviewed the judges publicly, they've now been appointed to the High Court. They are now being promoted to the Supreme Court. That is when they are not subjected to public interview. That's the proposal. Because they've already been subjected to public interviews at the time they are appointed as judges. You don't need... We are not qualified to determine the capacity, capability of a judge when they're already in office. But we are saying before they can occupy the office of judge, they are subjected to public interviews. So public interviews are still part of our system. Only when they are now being promoted to another higher office in, within the same judiciary, that is when they are not sub subjected. But the Judicial Service Commission is involved in the promotion of judges. It's not that the president will sit down on his own and say, I want that one to be a Supreme Court judge, and, 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 and that's it. it. The Judicial Service Commission, which is part of our Constitution, is also involved in the promotion of judges. So let's be clear about it. No, the, the Constitution is not going to be a ZANU-PF Constitution. If ZANU-PF wants to continue ruling this country, which I know um, it wants to, <laughs> they must make sure that any laws they bring about are popular with the people. If ZANU-PF brings in unpopular laws, they will surely be voted out in the next election. By the same people. So we are clearly aware, I'm saying this as Secretary for Legal Affairs of ZANPF, we are clearly aware that the people would be happy with this kind of change or would not be happy with that kind of change. We run the risk of uh, uh, changing ourselves out of power and we do not want to hand over power to the MDC. Not at all. So we are making sure that the changes we are proposing are likely to resonate with the majority of the people of Zimbabwe because we still want to rule, we want to win the next election and we are already preparing to win it. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mangbana. Uh, I think uh, most of the questions have been answered. Uh, over to you, Honorable Mwanzor. Um, the question specifically, the, 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 there are two questions um, directed to both of us, but there is one specific question directed to me, and I'll start with uh, that one. Um, are we saying that in this constitution, Absolutely, uh, there are no provisions which must be amended. There are provisions which have to be amended, but they are not the ones that ZANU-PF has picked. The provision that I think has to be dealt with is the provision relating to death penalty. Um, you are saying that uh, in, in terms of the constitution, a person below the age of 20, 21 cannot be hanged, uh, a person above the age of 70 cannot be hanged. Uh, a woman cannot be hanged. So you have a situation where a woman supplies the poison. The man who is 25 administers it. The man who is 25 hangs and the woman doesn't, even if she's the mastermind. Um, so if we are to remove the death penalty altogether, we must remove it uh, completely. 
and not segregate our own people. So I think that is worth to look at. But this is not what they've done. That clause to ZANU-PF is useless because it does not give them power. They concentrate power in the president. So they want this amendment designed to give the president more power, A, over his colleagues within ZANU-PF, B, over the whole country. And ladies and gentlemen, we can ask a few questions. What are we losing? What is Zimbabwe losing because judges are publicly, are publicly interviewed? Can we say we don't have adequate preparation for the coronavirus pandemic because judges are subjected to public interview? Are we saying we don't have food, we, don't, we have unemployment, we have corruption because the president does not have the power to appoint the prosecutor general? As far as I'm concerned, what ZANU-PF is doing in this regard is to use Norolon to cure HIV, using the wrong medicine to cure a malady. And if we go to the, the running mate uh, clause, um, by the way, Honorable Mangwana, um, it is incorrect that uh, all judges are going to be interviewed. No. What the law is saying is now, uh, the proposed law is saying is that judges of the superior court are insulated from interviews. Now, you can be interviewed as the judge of the high court and perform so dismally and still seek to go to the Supreme Court. People must be able to interrogate you to say you failed grade 7 and you want to proceed to write all level. So why do you want to do that? And the judge explains. This is the reason for the interview. You want to go to uh, a higher post, get interviewed. If you are the personal manager at a company and you want to take the job of a managing director, you go through an interview. A good personal manager is not necessarily a good general manager, I think. And then lastly, running mate. Honorable Mangwana says running mate uh, clause brings instability. And uh, with due respect, that proposition does not find support in empirical evidence. Let's just go. Countries which are very unstable, Somalia, Burundi, uh, as it then was, not now. Rwanda, as it then was, and not now. The Central African Republic, Zimbabwe, DRC, did not have a running mate clause, and yet they were unstable. America is stable. It has a running mate clause. If Trump was to die today, uh, um, the vice president, Mike Pence, takes over automatically. It's as smooth as that. And it is a stable entity. Malawi, poorer than us, um, has a running mate clause. They have a beautiful succession uh, 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 plan. They have a beautiful succession matrix. And it is stable. So it is not correct that a running mate clause breeds instability because evidence shows that countries which are unstable have nothing to do with whether they have running men, running men clause or not. So the people of Zimbabwe voted for a running mate. And at that time, uh, uh, if I may say, uh, we were together. But if we look at the presidential uh, results, even by the ZEC uh, figures, Chamisa over 2 million, Munangagwa over 2 million. It's a political polity which is torn in the middle. It's almost 50-50. And when you are changing the constitution, talking about two-thirds, you are ignoring the executive mandate that the people of Zimbabwe in this country gave. They gave President Munangagwa 50% of executive mandate by ZEC figures. And the other 49 point something percent doesn't belong to him. And those are living souls in our country, and we must consider them. Um, just lastly, I want to say, it is not broken. Let's not fix it. Um, this this uh, um, appointment of judges by public interview happens in the United States. They appear before Congress. They appear before Senate. Uh, in Kenya, public interview, South Africa, and so on. Zimbabwe has just started experimenting with that. It has saved us well. We have seen judges who don't deserve. We have seen prosecutor generals who don't deserve. And we are able to say this was uh, favoritism. This was on merit and so on. Why are we being denied 
that right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your responses, um, all of you. Mr. Ndokang, Mangami Dauvunza Vakar. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Susie. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is related to Honorable um, Mongwana. I just want to hear from you. Um, we have been in the process of uh, aligning the Constitution, uh, constitution as a law and um, that process has been completed. Why now are you interested in uh, having a menu? And 27 centimeters instead of maybe trying to align some of the laws inside the Thank you. Uh, Tatenda. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mount. I need to say the OJJ and Tatenda to my team. So, me, I'm not somebody who's going to align false persons, as we say. I would want to go to the ultimate and just say there should be extent, the extension of the women's court. It was a welcome remark, I tell you. Because now you can see now that the president of the Senate is none other than Mabel Chinomon. What that means is, means, ladies in this room, you should be motivated by that. And another one is, uh, I would want to confirm Honorable Former Banner, you said there should be an amendment. Why? Because looking at the time frame, it's not seven days on the line. The case they change, like, I can't let say, I would want to go back with my ex. So we have to move with science. So there is need for amendment. Right? And in the one amendment, I would want to propose in the constitution, may there be consequences we fought for the member of parliament, but they don't deliver. There should be a clause in the constitution that stipulates that if you don't deliver your chest out, even before your chair expires. 
Thank you, Tatinda. One more thing. Sorry, sorry. Okay, I don't know the thing. The question is there is my mistake. But I am not forgetting. May it also be in other 15 official languages. There is no question that is in Shona. Do you have any question? We have to interpret everything. We should be in Shona, sign language, real everything. I thank you. Thank you. So. There was a head, a man with a, a head, then uh, followed by the next one, then we come to my daughter, and lastly, then uh, they, we have a response. Uh, one, one question. Okay. Zimbabwe has got the biggest parliament in the world when you compare it to proportionality. South Africa has got a parliament of 380 MPs. Zimbabwe has got a parliament of 350 people. With 350 people juxtaposed to a population of 13 million, South Africa juxtaposed to a population of 55 million. You want to, 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 to expand the women's quota. For, for what reason? Who is going to pay for, 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 a, for an incompetent women's quota? Magai Kuris. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Next. Okay. Uh, my question is directed to Honorary to Mangwana. I think uh, when Lucy was speaking earlier on, she mentioned something about the resources. So I wanted to say with the way we are struggling in Zimbabwe, where are we going to get the resources for this massive project that you want to embark on? And on whose expense will it be? Thank you, uh, my daughter. Uh, uh. I would like to come to the to Honorable Mambani. I think if the, with this round of responses, you have to go back to the initial thing. Where did these amendments come from? Right? Don't I, I think at this round you want to avoid that one. I'm trying to get to a point whereby there's an amendment which is. Uh, providing for a uh, one one youth a uh, province, they are supposed to be channels by people. But uh, from my understanding, our population, yes, more than fifty something we are, they are youth. It's actually a point whereby you the SD people, devote to find out about the population. But you can give you ten percent to to my elders. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll start uh, from uh, I think your question was more to do with uh, patriotism and uh, also the opposition leader and the constitution, something like that. Um, first of all, there's no need for op office of the opposition um, president in the parliament. Uh, already in parliament right now, we have leader of the opposition. Uh, they are there already. Um, and it is the most senior uh, leader of the opposition who is a parliamentarian. So we have Lynette Kore, uh, who is the vice president of the MDC. She's the leader of the house. If our president had been a parliamentarian, he will be the leader of the opposition. So there is no need. When ZANU-PF said it was going to create that, it was creating something which was there, and we read through that. 
um, what was there, the issues that were there, had to do with the uh, real serious issues about national dialogue. And we thought that Zimbabwe had a political problem, a social problem, an economic problem that needed dialogue. That's what we wanted. And ZANU-PF responded by offering us um, a, a, a position. That's not what we wanted. We wanted a dialogue. Number two, uh, patriotism. Uh, my brother, you are very, very correct. That um, patriotism uh, means, I think, loving your country, understanding the problems that are in your country. I don't think you, uh, I think the majority of you, of you here are students. I don't think um, your problem, your problems, uh, problems, for example, uh, not having access to a grant and loan, uh, not uh, having access to adequate uh, facilities, accommodation, and so on, can be cured by having one youth going to parliament from each uh, province. No. The questions of unemployment, the questions of those things that deal with uh, the youth, uh, it has nothing to do with that ten, uh, the, the ten people that are being proposed. It's a populist clause which adds nothing to the lives of our people. Um, patriotism means I must understand that in this country not everybody agrees with my political party. Not everybody agrees with my policies. And the moment a country is like that, a, and that it is a plural, pluralistic polity, we must understand that and we must be able to take into account the diverse views of our, of our country. Uh, whether the person likes me or he doesn't like me, I have a duty of judging them as fairly as I can. So, love of our country versus love of, of, of our party. Our party, our president, uh, for example, um, putting too much power in the, in the hands of the president is not patriotism. We have seen uh, uh, countries where power was concentrated in the president. They disintegrated. Gaddafi had all the power. Saddam had all the power, General Tito had all the power, Mussolini had all the power, Hitler had all the power. And what happened to those regimes? They always go down. So it is unjust, it is unreasonable, it is irresponsible to concentrate power in the hands of one person and any infallible person for that matter. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Monzora, an infallible person for that matter. Okay, <laughs> uh, over to you, Honorable. Yes, I want to start by saying that um, the amendments are not concentrating power in one person. The Constitution is still remaining almost 90% as it was. That is the correct position. And, and certainly when we, when we led the writing of the Constitution, we knew that uh, power had to be balanced between uh, Parliament, the judiciary, and the executive, and that is not changing. That still remains the same. But let me respond to the individual questions. Oh yeah, the, the process of aligning um, our laws to the constitution is ongoing. I, I think a lot of uh, progress has been made. But still, that does not take away the power of parliament to also review the constitution. While they are also looking at uh, the implementation of the constitution in terms of uh, aligning with new laws. That is ongoing and I think they've done quite a lot of progress. And the, I think the party in government, in parliament, is responding to a request by the women that um, the idea of um, prescribing a period when women had to have seats ascribed to them was to make our people respond to the desire by women to be 
represented in parliament. So these 60 seats were created as a way of um, uh, informing our people that they, they must elect women. We, if there are other better ways of increasing gender equality by uh, having more women in parliament, I'm quite sure that they can be considered. But for now, a request was made by those who represent women that um, um, after, the, after these 10 years, we had not achieved more women representation in our parliament, and that is the, the reason behind the extension. But if there are other ways of increasing women's representation, besides extending the women's quota, I'm sure that those can be, can be considered. But the whole objective, look at the primary objective. The primary objective is to increase women's representation in our parliament. It's, a, it's not a secret that women form almost 52% of our population, and they are thoroughly underrepresented in our parliament. I think uh, through direct election, there are almost only about 14% uh, women in parliament who are coming through direct election. This is why this provision is being extended to increase women's representation. As far as the youths are concerned, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, there's been an outcry by, by the youths that um, they are failing to get adequate representation. We are not saying that no youths are being elected, but there are few. I, I think uh, I've been attending a function this afternoon where a, a youth aged 27 is doing a remarkable, a remarkable work. He's a member of parliament at 27. But those are odd, odd circumstances. In, in the main, uh, our youth take a long time before they can acquire uh, other muscles which require them to be elected uh, into parliament. So they, they made a, a proposition that we also want to affirmative action. And, and this proposal is a response to the request by the youth to have uh, more representation in parliament. Oh, democracy is expensive. If, uh, any democratic uh, assignment is expensive. So really, um, government is not just looking at the constitutional reform. It's only one of the aspects it's attending to. But certainly government is doing so much in terms of uh, turning around the economy, in terms of uh, creating jobs. We are not yet there, but efforts are being made to ensure that we address all the challenges this country is facing. We are not only dealing with the constitution. The country, yes, we have got economic challenges. We cannot deny that. We need jobs. We need more employment. We need more investment. We need to address infrastructure challenges. Um, we need to address our health infrastructure. We need to address education. Uh, all those are fundamental issues which require addressing. But running a country is not only looking at one aspect. Constitutional reform is also another aspect. The constitution is the foundation of the country. It is the pillar on which all other issues respond to. So addressing the constitution is not saying that we are going to ignore other socio-economic issues which require attention, but it is also important to address your constitution as the pillar and foundation of a nationhood. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, Lucy would respond, then we are winding up. Thank you very much, uh, Golden. Sometimes you have to give yourself an opportunity to respond because people may not ask you. I want to respond to the question um, that is directed to the issue of proportional representation in parliament. Allow me to say that as women, as a young person, as a youth in this country, I understand that this section is not bona fide. This, not, this is not in good faith. This is being done so that um, it's more patronage than uh, sincere. This is being used by political parties for us to feel grateful that you are extending the quota system for us as women. But let me be clear that we are not getting that. Because in the eighth parliament, we had 26 women who were directly elected. And in the ninth parliament, it decreased. I'm happy that Honorable Mangwana made an admission to that effect, that the issue of proportional representative is not serving its purpose. So why are we extending something that is not working and at the same time fixing things that are not broken? We go back to the issue of not giving us 
proportional representation. But can we implement section 17, section 56, and section 80 that speaks of 50-50 representation at all levels of leadership in this country? Not taking away an admission again to say that we form the biggest population in Zimbabwe. We are not going to take it and we are not going to continue being used by political parties for things that do not benefit us. It's uh, like I said when I was doing my presentation that the issue of proportional representative is just being thrown in there so that it is, be, it is used for people to fight. Because if I say we don't want it to be extended because it's expensive, because it's not working, some young person who has been waiting to get in parliament would like, sister, are you mad? So we don't want that. Can everyone compete? Equal footing, equal uh, rules, equal principles, level playing field. A winner, winner, aruza, aruza, aruza. Tosia shekunzu gira na tizi ne guita onge tiruku piwa because and. I think this is across all political parties. That's why we have the youth wing and the women's wing. Where is the men's wing? Where is it? We don't want it. We want to implement equality 50-50, not to extend something that is not working, something that is expensive, and we don't need it. Thank you very much, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I think let's clap hands for ourselves once again for... Um, uh, listening attentively, active participation, and also allowing our panelists to make their contributions. And as I indicated earlier on, this is the beginning of a series of many uh, discussions that we are going to, to hold here in Mashingo and other parts of Mashingo district. And you can agree with me that uh, this has been very are very useful and at least we have managed to pick one or two issues and um, the debate or the discussion uh, continues and uh, I think Gamu uh, indicated earlier on that uh, we are going to have public hearings it's also another opportunity if you so feel that uh, probably these uh, proposed amendments are not good or they are good it's your time to go in your numbers and make your contributions. At this moment, let me invite uh, Mr. Kuzipa uh, from Tozim to give us a uh, uh, vote of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Maunganize. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, maybe I'll start with the Honorable Mangwana uh, from ZANPF, uh, which is um, now the movement for democratic change, as he claimed. Uh, thank you very much for coming, Honorable Mangwana. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for, for coming. And also, Honorable Mungonzora. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I know traveling all the way from Marare. Uh, our roads are very bad, but we thank you for that um, sacrifice. And um, I'm also glad to, uh, to know that um, you now represent the real movement for democratic change. Uh, thank you very much. And to the audience, uh, thank you very much for sparing time. Um, leaving your busy schedules uh, to come to have this discussion. I think it's very important for us because um, I understand this constitution is said to be people driven. And if it's uh, people driven, uh, we are the people and we should have a voice. We should say our views. We should say uh, what we feel um, it is the best for us. So thank you for coming in numbers and uh, we hope um, from now onwards, we're going to have uh, this series of uh, uh, discussions and, um, and debates so that we try to find each other uh, for the good of Zimbabwe. Because at the end, we are um, all one and all represent Zimbabwe. So thank you very much for coming. I thank you all. Maita Nibasa, Nukutere, Ravaganaka.